we're going to start with the basics. First thing we need to remember is we use photos because literally a picture says a thousand words and photos provide a true and accurate portrayal of our crime scene and the physical evidence that's present there. They record the initial state of the scene before any evidence was removed or any alterations have been made. Now, all this information we get from these photographs can later be analyzed. And this is particularly useful when we're documenting evidence that might be destroyed in the process of analyzing it, like footprints. One of the first questions that gets asked when a new forensic student is working with photography is how many pictures should I take? So I'm going to ask you, how many pictures do you think you should take? One? Two of each piece of evidence? Ten? Fifty? Five hundred? Well, the answer is that you should take as many photos as are needed to fully document the evidence at hand. This could be a small number in a very limited scene, or it could number in the hundreds. My basic rule of thumb is that when in doubt, take a picture. When you're taking photos at a crime scene, record keeping is absolutely crucial. You need to keep a log. Now this log can be a book, it can be some pieces of paper on a clipboard, it can be a binder, it doesn't matter. You just need somewhere to create a list of all the photos that are taken because eventually you go back to look at them, they're all going to start to look the same. In that list should be the time the photo was taken, the location, the date, any special camera settings or filters that were used, um, the subject, which is simply what you're taking a picture of, and a brief description. In terms of equipment, what does a forensic photographer need? Well, they're going to need a camera. Now, we prefer film, and we'll talk about this in just a minute. Um, some lenses, usually a normal 35 millimeter lens, a wide angle lens, and a macro lens for close-up images, a flash, a tripod. Tripods are great because they can help someone take a, a very steady photo. Need a scale. Now, this isn't a way to weigh something. This is a way to show how large an object is. We're going to talk about those later. And you need your record log. And it's also useful to have a flashlight because sometimes we need to apply a little extra light from a specific direction before we take an image. Now, before I mentioned, we generally like to use film in our as our camera choice. Now, while we're gonna use digital cameras in this class, mainly the cameras on our cell phones, due to the fact they're easy to use and easy to get, why would crime scene photographers not wanna use them? Well, they wouldn't wanna use them because digital photos are too easy to manipulate, and thus they can sometimes call evidence into question. If there's even the hint of an idea, that a photo has been manipulated or photoshopped, that would be terrible when presenting that image in court. For example, I'm going to show you two pictures, and one of them has been manipulated. See if you can tell which one. Take a moment and look. We're going to call the top picture A and the bottom picture B. Well, if you picked A, you would be correct. A was the original photo, and B is the manipulated photo. If you take a look, you can see that the garden hose has been removed from the top of the photo. Some grass has been added into that area. And a shampoo bottle that this baby was holding has been removed. And that was all done in about five minutes in Photoshop. When you get to your crime scene, what should you take photos of? When you first arrive, you want to take approach shots. Approach shots show the exterior of your location, 
mainly coming in toward your entrance. You want to use a zigzag pattern as you get closer to any evidence that's at the scene so that all aspects of the exterior of that scene are covered. Now during this approach, both to exterior and interior evidence, you want to take some mid-range shots and some close-up photos of your evidence. So basically, you're going to be walking in a zigzag until you get to where your evidence is. And then I strongly suggest kind of circling your evidence and continuing to take photos as you get closer. I'm going to show you an example of that here. A scale is really handy because it lets you give some idea of the size of the object that you're photographing. All your close-up photos should be taken both with and without a scale. And if you look at the bottom of the screen, you can see an example scale there. It has both English and metric measurements. Now this shows the relative size of the evidence. Back in the day, police photographers used to sometimes use a dollar bill or a quarter or a pencil next to the evidence to show its relative size. Now, you always want to take a photo with a scale, but it's also important that you take a photo without the scale. Why might it be really important to take a photo without the scale? That's because there could be something hidden underneath that scale. So making sure you have images both with and without is critical. You don't want to get into court and have it brought into question if there might have been additional evidence hidden underneath the photography scale. And those are the basics of crime scene photography.